Greetings. Welcome to another episode of I Have a Testimony with your host, Brother Willie Muhammad. God came to us to seek and to save that which was lost. He raised the man from among us. He, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, laid the foundation. What I'm doing is something that comes from him through me and the thing that he uses in me to do the work is my faith in him and the word that he taught to produce men and women who wanted to clean up their life and build an independent nation for the glory of God. Today, we are blessed to hear the testimony of one of the, one of the rap industry's hip hop legends from the South. He's a South Bronx native. He climbed to the top of the game on one album at a time during the 90s and is still relevant today in the world of hip hop. He began his music career as a member of the hip hop crew Digging in the Crates. And he for, he also foregoed a solo career and set up his own label, Terror Squad, to which he signed such artists as Big Pun. Remy Ma, Tony Sunshine, Cuban Lynx, Armageddon, Prospect, Triple C's, DJ Khaled, as well as Discover producers Cool and Dre. You got a formula, man. Memory. It's like you just make dope records. Like, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, it's Solomon. Weird. Solomon. It's like, it's a hot one. Huh? It's not we can do about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not we can do about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> way. Press the button. Do you Play. feel? I mean, you've always made good records. <laughs> do you feel like your songwriting ability has gotten better as you've gotten older? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not, you know, I always say it. It's crazy. I always say that I'm the most underrated rapper in the history of rap music. You and Redman. Redman too, but you know, Redman. Believe it or not, Redman is one of my favorites. One of the best lyricists in the world. But if you look at Fat Joe with this crossover number one hits and all that. I've had so many top 10, top five hits in America, mm -hmm. number ones in America. I mean, white people, number one. What's Love still plays yeah, now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm just underrated. You know what I mean? And the fact that, you know, I can still do this. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like from the Bronx for real. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a real student of hip hop. So I know who's done what and who hasn't done what. You know what I'm saying? So I know there's, it's real history being made right now. You know what I'm saying? And, uh... Some of his many hits are Lean Back with Terror Squad, What's Love featuring Ashante and Ja Rule, Make It Rain featuring our own hometown legend Lil Wayne, and All the Way Up with Remy Ma featuring French Montana and Drake. He also appeared in several films, and he is a lover and supporter of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Fat Joe established himself in the music industry with Lean Back, a hip-hop single on which he collaborated with Terror Squad and Remy Ma, and which became one of the most popular songs played on radio stations in 2004, and even inspired the creation of several remixes performed by Lil Jon, Eminem, Lil Wayne, Jadakiss, and Chamillionaire. Not only did the single top the music charts, but it also won two Source Hip Hop Music Awards, namely for Single of the Year and Best Female Rap Collaboration. Bad Joe starred in Prison Song with Q-Tip and Mary J. Blige, Empire, and voiced a character in the animated film Happy Feet. So if you don't know who I'm talking about by now, let me help you. The one and only Fat Joe the Don. Thank you for granting us this interview, my brother. Hey, what's going on, brother? How you doing? I'm good, man. Thank you, my brother. And we're going to get right down to it. We'll start off because if it wasn't for Captain Dennis, man, I wouldn't have been able to get in contact with you. So I would like you to to ask you about your friendship, your love, and your respect for Brother Captain Dennis, and why is this so? Well, Captain Dennis, I know him for over 25 years, maybe 30 years, uh, him being in um, the community in New York City, always giving out to the youth, always reaching out to the people. Um, I'm just coming in the game, and they embracing me. Uh, Brother Arthur 4X was one of the original brothers that he came from Zulu Nation and introduced uh, pretty much the hip hop scene uh, to the nation of Islam. And it was just pivotal people and, and Captain Dennis is one of them. And we always remained in touch over the years. Yes, sir. So you are my brother, you are a thorough person in the hip hop community, as well as throughout many of the neighborhoods in New York, as well as many others. Your name is respected. 
You have earned that respect. And anyone who watches your interviews can tell you are in a new space. You're looking good. You're enjoying life. You're continuing to put out great music. You're happy. And on a phone call with you and, you, you and Brother Dennis and I, you said this phrase, and I saw you posted it on your IG yesterday. You say happiness is the new currency. So can you explain why you believe that it's the, it's the, it's the true and the new currency? And be miserable. And so if you stress and you allow uh, depression to hit you, if you allow worry to, to, to consume you, uh, no matter how rich you are, you could be in a dark space. So I've witnessed that the true currency is being happy. You know, being happy is being healthy, having your family happy, having your, having your moms and pops still around, whatever the case may be. To me, uh, as long as you're happy, you're the richest person on earth. On our, on our behalf, make sure you extend the birthday wishes to your, to your wife as well, because I know you're there celebrating the birthday. In, in September of 2017, Hurricane Maria devastated the entire entirety of Puerto Rico, and it caused a major humanitarian crisis, right? And originally, you know, it would say it was a Hurricane 5. It's one of the strongest hurricanes of that time in 90 years to hit the island, and it wrecked, it wrecked the lives of thousands of people. But we know that you use your voice to help do something when the United States government, like they did in here in New Orleans was very slow, or pretty much very, very slow. But you use your 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 influence to do something. Can you talk about how you helped? And also, if you know anything, what's the current state of the recovery today? Well, the truth is, um, I may be known for a lot of things, maybe known for being a, ta a talented rap artist, uh, but I'm really a kid from the Bronx, from the projects. Um, if it ain't for me, my family wouldn't be as good as they are, right? And so there was nobody before me who gave me wealth or gave me, you know, other than family, love, and knowledge. So I'm sitting there, I'm looking at my people, they hurting, uh, nobody was doing nothing for them. And my wife was sitting next to me and she said, yo, you better get up and rep your people. So I got up, I made one phone call, I knew that... <clears throat> that always gives back to the community, always looks out, and that was to Jay-Z. And so I told Jay-Z, look, we having a big problem over there. People don't have water. Women don't have hygiene products. Babies don't have food. I mean, I need you to help me any way you can. So Jay-Z bluffed me, and he said, I'm going to pay for a cargo plane. But these cargo planes are so big, they fit 250 thousand pounds of whatever you got to send so i didn't think that we could actually fill this plane and so when i sent out the apb and then brothers like spike lee and kevin hart and remy and everybody together started posting together uh jesus uh the 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 the, the, the governor of new york city he joined and said listen we'll give you the jacob javits center mm where you could tell everybody if they collect enough, they put it in the Jacob Javits Center and then we'll put it on the plane. So I did two different things. I did that. I mobilized the people through social media, but at the same time, I mobilized people I know that had a lot of money so that we could get money to pay for more planes. So even if it's a tragedy or whatever the case may be, these cargo planes want to get paid. And I believe it was like, 250,000 for every trip, right? Wow. So I had to reach out to all the rich people I know and be like, yo, my people are hurting. I need some. So it came from all the way as far as Dubai wow. to Miami to New York. So everybody who was cool with me, they started sending money in there so we could pay for these planes. And we sent four planes over there. We sent over a million pounds. It's, it's a, a very uh, unique story to this, right? So in the Jacob Javits Center, there was, uh, it, it, it was crazy. There was these uh, Nation of Islam brothers who pulled up in the truck filled with water, supplies, wow. uh, you name it, batteries, you name it. As they were pulling off, 
these Hasidic Jews pulled up in the truck right behind them and had water, supplies, and stuff like this. And it was crazy to see everybody come together as a humanitarian effort. You know, I always tell that story because that shows how passionate people could be um, when tragedy occurs. Yeah. And you know, I know this is something that you don't you don't talk about, but I want to ask you this question because a lot of times people like to focus on what they consider the negative of rap. But you do a lot of you do a lot of stuff, man. And like philanthropy wise, I came across an article where you provided maybe about a school with a bunch of laptops. So if you, I know you're not doing it for applause, but can you talk about your philanthropy works? Because I want it on record to show our brother. Well, I'm back. poor. I'm 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 poor in spirit. My DNA is poor. Um, I come from an oppressed people, and so no matter how well we do, I'm always with the people. And uh, opening businesses in my community is very important for me because it's, it's a place where, even though most people who've been in the game as long as me are out of touch, this is a place where you can reach me. Um, and we're giving back jobs, and we and we, and we don't just give we don't call them employees we call them business partners and i and i sit down with the youth and i tell them all the time brothers and sisters listen i want y'all to be bosses i want you to own your own boss I own your own business i want to help you own your own business i want to guide you through because i don't want it all for myself you know i have enough uh of, of of course i like to make more and more and more but um i have enough and so what we do is we give back computers to the schools. Uh, a lot of, over this COVID, there was a lot of our students, uh, black and brown, that uh, in my community, they started uh, doing school uh, virtual, but they didn't have tablets or laptops. So we recently donated a bunch of tablets during COVID to the schools in the surrounding areas of Harlem, Washington Heights. Then I have, uh, some schools I gave computers to and libraries. Um, I did an initiative because I own sneaker stores. And I said, what would Fat Joe? Because Fat Joe was a troubled kid. Fat Joe, you know, he grew up rough and tough, right? And so I said, what would change Joe's mind from being a troublemaker in school? What would motivate me? So I went, I came up with an Up in YC initiative to where I went with the Bronx Borough President, Ruben Diaz, who's a good friend of mine. So I went and we went to four schools. We wound up doing it in multiple, way more schools than that. But we went to four schools and we said, the kids who have the best attendance, the best grades, the best behavior, um, we will give that homeroom class brand new Jordan sneakers. What happened was the biggest bullies, the class clowns, wow. the guys who didn't want to come to school wind up being the winners in every school. And they wow. changed their life. And then when we went to give them the sneakers, uh, these kids start crying as they start telling their testimony and their stories about, I used to come to bully. I used to, I can't make it without my class now. I love my class. Because it was a group effort. So stuff like that. And then we constantly giving back um, food to the community. Food drives. Like meaning uh, uh Thousands of families we give food to. Um, yeah, I could be here forever, brother. Like, yeah. like, so we give them like we we pull up, we buy 18 wheelers full of food packages. So I'm not talking about just the turkey. I'm talking about soup, spaghetti, turkey, Everything. rice, beans, juice, uh, toothpaste, whatever. And then thousands of families come up and we give it to them, and we do that often. Wow. I do it even more, but we do that very, very often. Yo, man. To get back to the less fortunate. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I asked you that question, my brother, because people need to know that and about, about the work. So we're coming up on our first break. So we're going to pause for, for some brief public announcements. We'll be right back with our guest, brother Fat Joe. Be a part of the force that powers truth in journalism. Your support helps us to highlight solutions for a brighter tomorrow. Go to nnvnews.com slash donate. This is Sister Sajida Muhammad. We are proud to announce 
that the Sajita House commemorative Elijah coins are finally here. This priceless heirloom made from recycled copper from the messenger's home is now available at SajitaHouse.com. The hashtag bank black social media campaign made strides not only in revolutionizing how we bank, but also how we think. The movement inspired thousands of African Americans across the country to transfer or deposit millions of dollars into black owned banks. These are banks that will invest in urban communities, employ African Americans, support black businesses, and inspire black home ownership. This is a very proud moment for our culture as we are taking small, but significant, steps towards building Black power through Black wealth. Please share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. Follow us on social media at NMV News, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel at National Network View. I am Anissa Muhammad with NNVNews.com. One of the reasons the alma minister Louis Farrakhan is so loved is because he's slow to condemn and he's quick to listen and search for the value that exists in every human being he meets, regardless of their gender or their skin color. Since the children are listening more to rappers than they listen to their teachers, then the rapper could become their teacher in a much more profound way than the rapper is doing. I don't like to knock rappers. I love them. And I see their greatness beyond themselves. And I'm always trying to pull on what I know is in them. But there are forces that don't want to see us change. So how do, we, how do we stop it? A collective action on our part against the executives. Hmm. And, and then when we get to the point where we don't want to use the N-word anymore, and we understand the meaning of it, and we understand what it's saying about our psychology or our psyche, then you stop buying albums that low rate your people. You stop supporting the caricatures of black people. So, Joe, one of the reasons uh, we do this show is to give people an opportunity to really learn about the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who he is, because this media has really uh, falsely portrayed him as a human being. And my first my question I want to ask you, when did you or how did you first come to learn about the minister, about Minister Louis Farrakhan or even first hear him before meeting him? Oh, man. Uh, like I said, the first brother to bring me around. The Nation of Islam was uh, Brother Arthur Four X, and uh, he was uh, trying to bridge the youth. At the time, I was the youth. You know, I was I was nineteen twenty, uh, and bridge the youth with the Nation of Islam and just get the message out. And um, and so I had always heard of uh, Minister Farrakhan. I met Minister Farrakhan for the first time, I believe when the East Coast and the West Coast was going through a big, uh, you know, we lost Biggie, we lost Tupac. Uh, it was, it was, it was a, a real thing going on out there. I had got into it with some West Coast brothers, you know, um, and so Farrakhan heard about it and he set up a dinner in his house in, in Chicago. And so he invited the East Coast rappers, meaning New York, and the West Coast rappers. And, um, I came out there at the time I was afraid to fly. So I remember driving all the way over there to Chicago. And um, it was the first time I had to take my shoes off in anybody's house. Mm -hmm. And so we were, you had a bunch of gangster rappers with their shoes off in the house. Uh, and from New York, to me, to be honest with you, unfortunately, 
the only New York rappers that really showed up was me and Dougie Fresh. Wow. And uh, and the whole West Coast came. So it was q -tid. I mean, it, it was Ice Cube. It was Mac-10. It was uh, Snoop Dogg. The whole West Coast was there. And it was me standing up for the whole New York City and the whole East Coast. And we got heated. We got into some real serious words. And then Farrakhan calmed it down. And he was just telling us all we brothers and we learned, you know, if we learn to be think love each other and be positive and, and we'll make it and, and telling us how exceptional we was from just making it from where we came from and to where we at now, where we could be. And uh and of course he was like probably my age I am now. So he had way more wisdom than us. And so like now when you see me, you say, Yo, I watch you on your show. You say, Joe, we see you change. We see you more uh, love, brotherly. You know, at, at that time, it was hot-tempered, Fat Joe. And uh, and so he let us see the future, let us know that we brothers. And since that day, hmm. there was never an incident between the East Coast and the West Coast ever again. So everybody vowed to stay together. Everybody vowed to love each other. I went to the West Coast. I shot a movie with Mac-10. To this day, he's still my brother. To this day, there's no issues. Everybody loves each other. And that happened right there in Farrakhan's house. Yeah, because I know also at that piece, at that at that summit, that's where uh, Ice Cube and, and Common were able to squash their beef too, right? That was there for that. Um, they squashed their thing there. Uh, I, I think Dr. Cornell West was there. So a lot of people was in there, man. It was it was it was, it was a historical moment that brought about peace in the hip hop community, and uh, and I've always respected them for that for bringing us together because that could have ended tragically, that could have ended in violence, and uh, the fact that he brought us together and showed us that love, that's one of the many things I've always admired him for. Yes, sir. And when we were on the phone with myself, you and Captain Dennis, you spoke about how. The minister asks that people leave that meeting and make a song just talking about the hidden hand, which oftentimes causes a lot of these beefs. And you said out of everybody that was there, you did it. And we can go online and actually see the song, The Hidden Hand. So can you talk about that track and the relevance of that track then and, and even today? Well, you know, I've always been a man of my word. If, 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 if The only thing I got is my word, my word mm. is bond. And so when the minister brought about, brought about peace and he was explaining to us like, look, don't fight each other, there's a hidden hand. He told all of us to make a track called Hidden Hand. And I was the only one who made the track called Hidden Hand. And I'm, I'm proud of it. Um, and it was just talking about reality, talking about life, you know, struggles in life and how we need to overcome it. And so I, I did what I said I would do. And in addition to that, there's a, a video on YouTube we wanted to show, but we didn't know if they're going to end up flagging us for the music, where you are in the video with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Can you talk about that experience and that whole video? Oh, Minister Farrakhan, man, he, he uh, he's something else, man, where he goes, he, he'll call out of nowhere and be like, Joe, I want to walk through the Bronx with you. And next thing I know, I'm walking through the Bronx with Minister Farrakhan. Or I'm in a hotel and somebody taps me on the shoulder and be like, yo, the minister want to see you. A random hotel. <laughs> and they take me up through the service elevator and, I, and I'm up in the penthouse with them and we watching boxing matches. Like, it's like, he just come out of nowhere. It's like, yo, Joe. And they be like, Joe, he want to see you. And something he always uh, try to bring about um, and this was very beautiful, is teaching black brothers and Latino brothers and sisters that we all the same and that we all go through the same oppressions and we all need to rise together. And, um, and, and I've always respected that. I've always loved that about the nation. Whenever I'm around them, they always, man, brother, we need more Latinos. We need, you know, and, uh, and I really, really res always respected that. And it always stood here. And when you see uh, 
Big Pun may rest in peace when he made his big hit, still not a player. It was about Boricua Morena, bringing the Latinos and the black people together. So mm. It's very important to me. Yes, sir. Now you talked about this, you mentioned it just now. You know, people see the minister, he's on the, the stage, he's, he's speaking the truth, but he also has a side where, like you said, you've been around him where you all talked about boxing, right? Can you talk about some of the conversations? Oh, he's a big boxing. boxing. He's a big boxing. And and I'm gonna tell you a secret that, that, that I might get banned from this interview. Uh, uh brother Mustafa actually smiles. <laughs> <laughs> That's my guy, and he actually smiles. And uh, you know, I've had fun times with him, uh, watching his son play basketball, uh, and things of that nature. It's always been a beautiful uh vibe, a beautiful environment, nothing but love in the room, nothing but beautiful energy. Uh, and the minister's a big, big fan of boxing. So he he would ask me about Trinidad because he knew I knew Felix trinidad personally yeah and he was a fan of felix trinidad he'd be like man that boy can hit with both hands yo he can hit with both hands so um that that's all i know right yeah. so i can't you know i gotta stay true to self you know and all i know is beautiful vibes good times upliftment of the people you know taking people um and, and giving them making them feel important and blessing them with love. That's all I know. Yeah. And since we're on, a, since we're talking about boxing, I got to ask you this question, man. What do you think about Canelo, man? I think Canelo's good, but you got to watch out for this young brother. He's Puerto Rican. His name is Edgar Balanga. He's okay. sixteen and zero with wow. sixteen knockouts in the first round. Like so, he pulling off like a Mike Tyson, two thousand twenty one. I know nobody's iron Mike, but this guy, he got the potential. Have you seen this young brother? He's he looks like he's almost about seven feet seven feet tall. <laughs> oh my goodness. He is hard. It's hard, man. And fast. And what about fast. uh what about uh Javante Davis? Oof. Tank is serious. Tank is serious. That last fight when he dropped that guy with the uppercut in the corner, and that guy was fighting him. That was a great fight. And and, and so in any sport that lets you know who's great and who's who, who's great and who's exceptional so you know the guy put up a real serious fight with tank and tank did what he had to do and yeah. and, and so that's how i look at sports you know um with everybody the great tom brady patrick mahone you know uh, you know if you're going to be the michael jordan of any sport you have to find a way to pull through and win that is true. So we're coming up on our next break, my brother. So we're going to pause for these brief announcements and we'll be right back. Be a part of the force that powers truth in journalism. Your support helps to combat false media. Cash App NNV News. This is Sister Sajda Muhammad. We are proud to announce that the Sajda House commemorative Elijah coins are finally here. As we renovate and restore the former home of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, we have recycled the old copper gutters and downspouts and created a one ounce 39 millimeter coin made of 100% pure copper. Each coin is professionally graded and has its own barcode and registration number. This priceless heirloom made from recycled copper from the messenger's home is now available at sajdahouse.com. Worldwide, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Download the Final Call radio app and take us everywhere. On your phone, on your computer, on your tablet, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can also log on to FinalCall.com and click the Listen Live button. Or FinalCallRadio.com. Final Call, Final, Final Call, Call Radio. Radio. The official voice of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. Thank you for tuning in to NNV News. Please share your thoughts with us in the comments section below. Follow us on social media at NNV News and please subscribe to our YouTube channel, National Network View. 
This is Clifton Muhammad with NNVNews.com. You know, one of the reasons why Fat Joe is such a legend in the hip hop industry and is able to have relationships with the new, the young and the upcoming hip hop artists is because he does his best to help them to avoid the mistakes he has made and other mistakes he has seen others make in the hip hop industry as heard in this clip. I'm an open book, man. Mm -hmm. Fat Joe, it is what it is. I'm the truth, man. You know, you, it is what it is. I don't hide nothing. And, and even with these young rapper cats, you know what I mean? That, be confused about business and, and the business. And I, I sit down with them. They want to talk to me and I'm in the next studio and it's the young hottest rapper and he feel he's getting jerk or something. I'd be like, yo, sit down. What's up? All right, this is how it's going down. This, this, that, this is, you need to make that move. You need to this. Cause it's, we gotta, we got to, like, I used to be upset with the, the pioneers or, or the people who, the successful guys who came before us. I'll say some names like Russell Simmons, who's my Don. Like, I love Russell Simmons, but those guys never turned around and gave us that knowledge. We have to learn for, our, for ourselves. If Russell Simmons would have told me, hey, don't beat up the number one program director in the country who's connected to 100 <laughs> program directors. Your record's never getting played again on none of these stations. I'd have been like, all right, let's not beat them up. Right. Like, you know, like I would tell the young boy right now, I'd be like, yo, hey, Boogie, chill. Like, don't mess up your money, nigga. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I'm, it's my job. What about Takashi? Because you sat down with Takashi. I told him, too. The whole podcast I did with him was telling him what was to come. So, Joe, from watching your videos, man, over the, and just following you over the years, you are a very transparent person. You keep it 100, as, as people say, in, in the urban area, right? You keep it real. How has that helped you in your ability to to catch the ear of the young rappers big to be able to give them some guidance uh as you talked about in that clip well you gotta be true to yourself you know and um you know many years ago i went to it to uh to many years before i had a record deal i went to howard university they had this big summit and they had all my favorite rappers on there and um and and one one person that asked somebody who was like in my level now and I asked somebody who we really, really admire, um, what do you think about this new group leaders in the new school? And he was like, man, I don't know what them young boys are saying. I don't know that. And I remember it hurt me so much. And I said, you know, this guy's old and he's mad. Mm. And I said, I will never be this guy. And so if I become successful, I will always embrace the youth, never talk bad about the youth. And if I see where somebody needs some guidance or some help, I will give them the free game. Uh, I will tell them the mistakes I made so that they don't have to go through the same mistakes. And that's pretty much how I live my whole entire life. Very transparent. Uh, you learn as much from me from my flaws as you'll learn from my victories. That's true, man. And and brother, that's that's one of the reasons why you're 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 still relevant, brother. And keep keep up that spirit and that mindset. I want to go back to this question. You know, the Uncle Minister Louis Farrakhan is a man who is painted falsely and portrayed in a negative light by the media. You know, because of his willingness to speak on the behalf of the down the downtrodden and the poor and the people that have been taken advantage of. You know, what has allowed you to see the Uncle Minister Louis Farrakhan? as not being the man that the media portrays him as? Uh, you was popping in and out. Okay. Um, I could only speak to my truth. Right. You know, I met a, a, a bunch of brothers who explained to me that they probably would have been in prison or dead if they didn't meet the minister and his teachings changed their life and made them positive. Um, uh, all he's ever spoke to me about is peace, unity, love, um, and everybody coming together. 
I can only speak to my truth. I don't know what other people think or anybody thinks. The man's always been positive to me. Uh, he's always did positive things for his people in my community. And so I salute him. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm from the city of New Orleans and you're familiar with Lil Wayne and Baby and everybody. And, you know, we're here in the city and I know many talented hip hop artists who make real great quality music, but years have passed and they just have not had that moment. And, and I can tell it wears on them, right? What advice would you give to them here in New Orleans and even all around regarding how to handle that? Well, the first, how to handle that, that's that's like a loaded question. <laughs> um, it, 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 two different ways. Uh, I would use social media because it's free. And I would go and I would use social media as much as I can because it's free. And, and you could press one button and it could get out to the whole entire universe. That's advice I would give them or any artist coming in the game. Now, um, it's hard when you got to understand <clears throat> there ain't, but I believe, I'm not sure, but it's close, 300 NBA players that, that, that play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the guy who never gets to play, who's number 15 on the bench, he was the best in the city ever created, scoring 100 points a game in high school, mm -hmm. right? And so it's millions of people trying to occupy these, being the NBA. It's even worse being a rapper because for some reason, to people, it feels like it's easy. It's it, it could be done. It's obtainable, uh, because the guy who's number one looks like me, or I could identify with their with their growth coming up. But it's like one out of every ten million rappers actually make it successful. So I always tell everybody, I'd rather be a one hit wonder than nothing. Because at least mm -hmm. if I'm a one hit wonder, I'm able to walk the red carpet, see my favorite artists, whatever. So. It's very hard to be successful at rapping. So so I'm all about having people believe in their dreams, going for what they do. But I also am realistic. Even Fat Joe as an artist, I make money, great money. I'm not Sean P. Diddy Combs. I'm not Jay-Z. These guys were a little bit more blessed than me financially. My daughter's sitting right in front of me. I tell her. You're not Sean P. Diddy Combs' daughter. <laughs> Be clear, right? And so we all have our own realities. And so artists got to know, look, this is what I love to do, but I might have a kid or two. I can't just sit in the couch playing Xbox talking about I'm a rapper. So you got to do that nine to five or, or be an entrepreneur because because I also believe, and I had a big argument yesterday at dinner with um, people I love, family members, and, and successful people. Because, I, 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 you know, college, right? I believe, unless you're going for a specific thing as being a lawyer, being a doctor, being a biochemist, something that you need to go to that college for, it prepares you to be a worker the best elite worker you can be. I'm about being an entrepreneur and owning your own business and, and, and having your own ownership and taking your future into your hands. So they're like, you know, it's so important to go to college. And I'm like, yeah, but could you take the same amount of money you spending a kid going to a college and getting them a business and getting them started at owning their own business? And so we had, you know, everybody has their own point of it, but you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a little different. I believe in ownership. I believe in being an entrepreneur. Um, and that's how you learn on the job. Training is how you get to be a boss. It's just my my opinion. Yeah, that, you, your, your words about that whole debate reminds me of that book, uh, The Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And the guy talks about that whole, it's an interesting book, man, because he had his rich dad was not his biological father. It was his friend's father who was an entrepreneur. His poor dad was his father who had all of these degrees, but he was still in debt. And if you read the book, he has some videos on YouTube, it's very powerful. And he talks about how the world is changing. And I'll ask you this, because I see this question is often asked to a lot of sports figures where they ask them, at 
what was that moment for them when they realized like yo i'm really good at basketball i'm really good at football for you what was that moment when you realized that yo i'm really good at this music look i was a hustler you know you know i, I left my mother's house when i was 14. i'm not trying to glorify nothing especially in, in such a positive space but since i was 14 i left my mother's house because I used to bump head, and still to this day, I bump heads with my father. I'm sure he's proud of me, but, you know, I've been taking care of him for maybe 20 years, and, you know, we still bump heads, right? <laughs> it, it's just, that's just the way it is. And um, and so I was a hustler that loved hip-hop. I grew up in the Bronx where hip-hop was birthed and born, and but I never thought I could really do it. And when I did it, I just knew that people would embrace it because they was like, oh, he's a real one. Like we seen him in the streets. We knew what he did. But um, skill level wise, I never thought I was as good as the Rakims, the Nas's, the Jay-Z's. And then at some point, I just kept going and practice makes perfect and kept and I and I believe you need to align yourself or create a a, a fictional competition between you and the best even if it's as an athlete or as a rapper so i would have a poster up every album of jay-z and nas because mm. to me they were the best and i would compete with them as much as wow. i could do my music and um and then i got to a point where um maybe the last 10 years where i felt like wait a minute i might be as good as these guys now like <laughs> you know seriously like yeah. i really felt like Man, I'm, I, I never thought I could be as good as these guys, and 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 so and here we are. I mean, that is, I guess, my whole career was a work in progress to get to where I'm at now. You know, as you can bear witness to this, there have been a lot of people who we we saw them and we don't see them now. Yeah. But every decade, your name is mentioned. You're in the mix, right? And another thing, you can if you can share on this, you have a great skill and picking very jamming or slamming hip hop tracks. Cause you know how some people they can rap, but sometimes they pick a track and it's like, man, what were you thinking? How do you do that? Well, you know, I was signed by this guy. Uh, he's the chairman of Warner Brothers now. His name is Craig Kalman. And the only good thing the man ever told me was he sat me down and he says, I understand you're a tough guy. You come from a tough place. I got to be honest with you. But this is probably the only thing he was honest with me about. He said, um, he said, you're not like a big rapper that, you know, we're going to give you a video, radio budget. And if that doesn't succeed, then there is no part two. There is mm -hmm. no other song. There is no other video. So I had to train my ears in a pristine way. I had to train my ears to only know hit records. And so I, I, I trained myself to think like a radio programmer, uh, somebody who picks the hits, somebody who plays the hits. I would travel to, to America on a tour bus because I was scared to fly. And I would listen to radio everywhere. It may, may it be New Orleans or Arizona or South Carolina and see these kids playing in the grass and listen to the radio and what they were playing and what they were allowed to play while these kids dance through the grass. And so that's how I taught myself how to pick nothing but hit records. And I think I got like a 90% track record, to be honest with you. Man, listen, you're flaming, man. That that uh that lean back, that lean back beat is oh my goodness, that's so excited. The one with Cardi B, a lot of them, we can run through all of them, man. We're on our, now, on our top 10, top 10 rhythmic. It has Rihanna on there. It's the old uh, Luther Vandross Never Too Much sample. It's called Sunshine Delight. And because uh, the corona has so many people passed away, people sick, people down, people uh, people going through tough times, you know, we came up with a track just to uplift the people. Wow. And, and it's called Sunshine Delight. And it's all about having a good time. And, and, and it's the type of music your mother would play while she's cleaning the house on a Saturday. It's the type of music your grandmother would dance with your mother. And so right. we made a track, which is top 10 right now, that is purposely meant 
to solely make people feel good. Wow. So we're coming on our last break and we'll be back and we'll be wrapping up the interview shortly. Thank you, my brother. We'll be right back. We'll pause for these brief announcements. Be a part of the force that powers truth in journalism. Your support helps us to highlight solutions for a brighter tomorrow. Go to nnvnews.com slash donate. He anointed our head with oil. Till our cup runneth over. He who master for all cometh. That is he. Greetings from National Network View. This week's final call cover story headline reads, Today's Prisoners in the Crack Cocaine Drug War. This story details the disparity in sentencing prison time for drug dealers and those who are victims to the addiction of these narcotics. Powder cocaine and crack cocaine are continuously pushed through the veins of our community in every city. The devastation has not let up on black lives or our families. This final call, volume number 24 edition, features the middle page article by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan message entitled, The Signs of Distress and Confusion Plaguing Man and Nations. To read more, subscribe to FinalCallDigital.com and tune in to the all new Final Call Radio. This is the NNVNews.com Final Call Cover Report. The Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan is constantly working to increase the unity between various communities of people of color. He sees the value of our unity and he also knows that such unity is viewed as a threat by some who seek to disrupt such efforts. So the enemy is playing us off against each other. At one point, we were the largest minority. I don't know what that means. Oh, we're the largest do-nothing group in the country. Then along comes Mexicans and Latinos that have outstripped us in terms of production of life. So you are a larger minority, but you're very progressive, very progressive. So the difference between us is we've been made each other's enemy. We've been made to look at each other like we are the real enemy. And the enemy sits back and laughs because he knows he's the author of all of this, that in our unity we can overcome it and do something better. And you talked about this earlier, Brother Joe, and I'll come back and ask you, can you talk more about the importance of us not getting caught up in these these, 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 what I would say, manufa manufactured differences between the black and the brown communities because we're all one people. Well, we're really one people. <laughs> and, uh, and I understood that at an early age, you know, growing up in the all black community, um, my projects was maybe 90% black, you know, and it's weird for me because I was the blonde haired, green eyed kid growing up in the projects looking like the Beatles, but I've always been embraced since day one. So I never knew the animosity between that. I know our brothers in the West coast, they think a little bit different. You know what I mean? So all I've, all I've been able to do is throughout my whole life, express unity, love, people coming together because the strengths in numbers that, you know, power of the people is, is more important than any ide ide ideology ideology you know what i'm saying so as long as you got the numbers and the people uh and realize that when you go to a uh any community that's a, oppressed or or impoverished with bad hospitals and bad schools there's always the black and brown people in there so yeah. if they found a way to come together and think alike you know it would be definitely more powerful and more beneficial to both and the last of these two questions, also in your new, in this new, the, 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 the currency is the true happiness, right? Happiness is the true currency. We've also, I'm also noticing you've shaped your you, 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 you weight loss, man. You're getting into your health. So you can talk about that whole process and what inspired it. 
I just love life, man. Shout out to Captain D and the Peacekeepers. But I just love life, man. And, and, and I really never understood people who take their life, no matter what circumstances, depression, no matter what you're going through financially. I just love life. And I want to be here as long as I can possible with my family and just enjoy life and, and watch my kids grow up and get grandkids and, and, and just be happy. You know what I'm saying? So that, that so health is wealth. So it's all combined. The happiness is the new currency. Health is wealth. All that is, is embodied as one. And this is our last question. I see you, the, the uh, social media and the internet is on fire with your podcast, man. You can talk about that and what are you trying to uh, accomplish with it? Well, it's been therapeutic for me. You know, COVID was really, really scary for me because I am pre-diabetic. Mm. Uh, I used to be diabetic when I was young. And then because I lost weight, the diabetes went away. But I'm still, I still treat myself as if I'm diabetic. So sugar-free mm. stuff, you know, you know, working out, you know, can't overload on the sugars or nothing like that. Mm. And so, you know, I was scared, frightened. A lot of people I knew were dying. And I mean, tough guys, generals. You know, guys who were like really tough were being taken out left to right because New York City's my hometown and it was the epicenter. And so I picked up the podcast, I put up the T the IG live, my daughter put it up because I had never did it before then. And she starts, she's my executive producer. <laughs> and so, and that's another powerful thing, bro, because my daughter's 14. Wow. And she's the executive producer of this show. Wow. And it shows other young sisters that they can be bosses as well. And so, and so what I'm trying to teach the youth and teach everybody is that we're bosses. We're exceptional under any circumstance. We go, we overcome all odds to be exceptional and be great. So I'm trying to teach my daughter. She's great. And all the other young sisters that follow her, they're great. You know, and 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 that's what this whole podcast is about. It's always about positivity. You know, so if you got a young brother like Joel Santana came out of prison, we'll tell a story about how he got locked up. But now where you plan to take it from here? Bobby Schmurder, where we going from here? Yes, how are we gonna be positive? How are we gonna give back? And you'd be surprised. Fat Joe's not the only guy giving back to the community. All the artists are giving back. We just try, it's, it's a corny thing to really talk about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, my brother, we thank you for giving us this, this moment of your time because we know you have a flight that you have to get to. Man, I know the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is gonna be pleased and Brother Mustafa when they when they see this interview. Thank you, man. Shout out Captain Dennis for helping to facilitate this and may God bless you and your family. You have any other closing words you wanna share? Feel free to share, my brother. All I can say is that I'm glad they didn't throw me out this beautiful house in front of you guys, because it will be a pumpkin in 10 minutes. <laughs> you're the Don, man. They can't, you're, the, you're the Don. You're the Don. They can't throw the Don out, man. So God <laughs> bless you and, and, and give, your, give your daughter and your family our blessings, man. Keep Thank up you the so work. much. God bless you. Right. Peace. Bye. So for those of you all who are watching, we thank you all for tuning in. This is Brother Willie Muhammad with National Network View, and we want to encourage you all to tune into our shows that take place Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a daily news network. Spread the word, like the videos, leave comments, and make sure you follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and share the, share the news and share the word about the great work that National Network View is doing until next time see you brother willie muhammad i have a testimony god came to us to seek and to save that which was lost he raised the man from among us he the honorable elijah muhammad laid the foundation what i'm doing is something that comes